transport is have been prevented by the ship's crew who were instantly alarmed. Those of us who were the most active when the moment put down in the decks again. There was such a noise and confusion amongst the people of the ship as I never heard before to stop them and to get the boat out to go out of the slaves. Two of the ledges ground, however, but they got the other. And after was flogged and most really, for thus preferring death to slavery. During my passage, I first observed the use of the quadrant. I had with astonishment seen a man that made observations with him. I could not think what this could mean. At last, one of them, taking notice of my supplies, and willing to increase it, as well as to gratify my curiosity, one day made me look through it. Clouds appeared as land, and disappeared as they passed along. This heightened my wonder, and I was now persuaded more than ever before that I was in another world, and that everything about me was filled with magic. At last we came in sight of the island of Barbados, at which the whites on board gave a great shout and made many signs of joy to us. Many merchants and planters now came on board. They put us in several parcels and examined us attentively. They made us jump and pointed towards the island, signifying that we were to go there. We thought by this that we should be eaten by these ugly men as they appeared to us. So soon thereafter, we were put back down under the decks again. And there was much dread and trembling amongst us, nothing but bitter cries to be heard throughout the night in these apprehensions. In so much that at last, the whites got some old slaves from the island to pacify us. They told us we were not to be eaten, but to go to work, and to go to the land where we should see many of our own country people. And sure enough, as soon as we were landed, there came to us Africans of all languages. We were immediately conducted into the merchant's yard. We were all pent up together like so many sheep in a fold. That's everything I saw was new to me. Everything filled me with surprise. I was astonished on seeing people on horseback. I could not think what this could mean. And indeed, I thought that these people would pull nothing but magical arts. We were not many days in the merchant's yard before we were sold out of the usual manner, which is this. On a signal given, as a beat of a drum, all the buyers rushing at once into the yard where the slaves are confined and make choice of those parcels which they like best. The noise and clamor with which this is attended and the eagerness visible in the countenances of the buyers does not serve a little to increase the apprehensions of those terrified Africans who might be supposed to consider themselves the ministers of that destruction to which they think themselves devoted. In this manner, without scruple, our friends and relations separated, perhaps never to see each other again. I remember the vessel I was brought over, in the men's apartment, several brothers who in a cell were sold in different lots, and it was very moving to see and hear the many cries at party. Oh, you now know, Christians. Might a terrified African ask you, loan you this from your God, who said unto you, do unto all men as you and men should do unto you? Is it not enough that we are torn from our country and friends to toil for your luxury and lust again? Why must husbands lose their wives, brothers their sisters, parents their children? Surely this is a new refinement in cruelty, by which, although it has no advantage to atone for it, does after this distress, and adds flesh hearts even to the legendness of slavery. Published in 1789, Epiano's autobiography went through 11 printings shortly thereafter, making him the wealthiest and most famous African in the world. His notoriety was short-lived. He died in 1796, a few months after his wife passed, leaving a daughter who eventually inherited his fortune. Ladies and gentlemen, I want to thank you all for having me here today. I want to especially thank Dr. Shields, Dr. Shelton, and Dr. McPartland. And um, 
If y'all have any questions, I'd be more than happy to answer them for a few minutes. He uh, left his inheritance to his daughter. Basically, that's about it. Um, yeah. Some might want to know the connection between Wilberforce and Antioch. Well, um, around the late 1870s, there was a groundswell support for the abolition movement for uh, of the slave trade. It had begun before the American Revolution with uh, writings by a gentleman named the Reverend James Ramsey, who was um, an acquaintance of Equiano. Equiano had met him uh, in St. Kitts, in the in West Indies, for his enslavement. And so uh, he wrote this controversial um, piece against the slave trade. Um, this is shortly before the American Revolution. But then the American Revolution happened, and so for for the period of the American Revolutionary War, um, there is a slight, you know, this between you know, the debate about the slave trade. So, abolition of the slave trade sort of the back seat towards, you know, fighting the Yanks in the colonies. But when the Revolutionary War ended, there was this kind of groundswell for the abolition of the slave trade. Um, for example, there was a petition signed by 10,000 uh, citizens of Manchester for the abolition of the slave trade. And so, around 1787, King George III set up uh, a special, uh, he wanted a special investigation done by the Privy Council. You, you, you think of it as kind of like a committee that we would have today in the States, you know, the Finance Committee, you know, uh, the Armed, Armed Forces Committee, in you know, the Congress. And so there is an investigation done by one Lord Hawksbury. And so he was accepting all kinds of uh, you know, testimony from different from people with different walks of life. Um, Epignano was not allowed to uh, participate in that. Uh, no one of color was allowed to participate in terms of giving testimony before Parliament. Um, but he was present for nearly all of uh, the debates going on in Parliament. Uh, you know, William Wilberforce is one of the people who was involved, was involved in speaking out against the slave trade. That's all I have. Other questions? Anyone else have a question? Please, ask, don't feel free to ask. I mean, it could be anything banal, like, you know, um, why is he wearing a wig? Or, yes? I was someone who became so prominent such unlikely conditions have been all but forgotten. By the general public? Yes. I think, Go, no, please. I think, you know, it's, it's the time period. And I think because this is America, we don't really think about, you know, history beyond our own borders. We got the American Revolution, we have the Civil War, you know, but we don't think about, you know, the abolition of the slave trade and slavery in terms of uh, a context outside of America. So we hear of someone who was black, but he wasn't American to talk out against the slave trade is kind of peculiar to us. And so I think it's just um, really just a lack of general knowledge amongst the American people in general. Sir, um, what age did he come over? They say that he was, well, he says he was 10 years old, although it's been disputed because he was baptized in England in 1759. And according to the baptismal records, he was 12 years old. So if you do the math, he was, he was probably born a little bit uh, later than 1755. So he might have been younger when he was taken. He was, he was taken. The latest research shows that he was maybe around eight, but um, in his community, 
community, they didn't 